Hello and welcome to another episode of the Funds Download podcast series. I'm Phil Graham, Head of the Investment Funds team here at Harneys, and joined today by Aki Pulseni Hussain, um, who is Global Head of our regulatory practice. Aki, welcome. Thank you very much, Phil. Pleasure to be on this podcast. Now, I have to say, Aki, you have one, I would say, of the most diverse practices in our firm. I'm always fascinated by things that are on your desk. And very sadly for our listeners and, and for myself, uh, an awful lot of it is, is obviously highly confidential. So, so we probably can't get into um, the, the really interesting celebrity stuff. But obviously, one part of, of what you do is based around you know, regulatory applications and licensing applications that will, will fundamentally affect asset managers. And, and it's that really I want to touch on rather than get your insight into the paparazzi world. Given your multifaceted role at Harleys and the fact you will speak to asset managers all over the world on, on a regular basis, could you, could you give us a feel for the initial considerations someone should have when they, when they come to us and they're looking to form an investment management vehicle for the first time? But what are those conversations like when you, when you have them with clients and what should they be considering? Yeah. Good question, Phil. I've got quite a diverse set of cases on my desk, and I think that boils down to the fact that we really do, I think, as a firm and certainly as a practice area, try and drill down into the specific circumstances of each manager and each client and really get to what what it is that they're trying to achieve. And I think with managers, you've you've got all the commercial issues. So are you, for example, looking for, are you dealing with a private equity fund, a venture capitalist, something like that on the one side, are you dealing with a, with a hedge fund? These issues become relevant because we need to gauge whether the product that we would suggest to a client is going to be, you know, going to provide for an open-ended style investment or closed-ended style investment, and the regulation surrounding those is different between the two of them. Equally, it's important to understand the part of the market they're from, so that we're speaking the right language to them. So you're looking at things like whether you're whether you want to be open, closed-ended, uh, the part of the market. Uh, what are the uh, what's the extent of uh, predicted assets under management post setup, uh, post restructuring? Uh, you know, how big a fund are we talking about? You know, we deal with uh, one end of the spectrum, USITS funds, um, highly regulated EU USITS funds, and at the other end of the spectrum, we could be dealing with a you know, largely unregulated limited partnership based offshore. So, it, and it's it's all those areas in between. That's very insightful, and, and, and frankly, you know, asking you to summarise everything you do in, 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 in sort of a five-minute perspective is impossible. So I think that's absolutely right. What, 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 I, what I'm really interested by is that you've got a broad experience of working with, with many regulators as well. And you know, I, I can remember you arriving in the BBI. You, you arrived not long after me, and at, at the time, way back when, I remember thinking, you know, what, what is this incredibly experienced regulatory person from, from London going to actually have to do in the, in the BBI? You know, there was obviously some legislation, and it was evolving. But I guess, you know, when, when I'm when I'm talking to a lot of asset managers, um, what we really want to know is is, is around the, the, the regulators themselves. And um, clearly, people come to us wanting to know that if they do set something up, you know, on, on, on the asset management vehicle side and also on the fund side, but the regulator is going to approve it. And the regulators, they want to know a timing process. Timing is often so critical. But certainly you, did, you dealt with the, the, the UK regulator, you dealt with the FSC, you dealt with SEMA, you dealt with um, CISEC in, in Cyprus, and obviously have experience of dealing with, with other regulators as well. What would you say are the sort of critical differences of approach, maybe taken by the traditional Caribbean regulators um, in, in, in the BBI and Cayman, versus maybe our sort of, you know, Luxembourg, Cyprus approach? What would you say when a manager wants to explore different opportunities, are the differences between them? So I think if we're fulfilling our, uh, let's say, intermediary role well, then a lot of the uh, toing and froing between regulators and, and particular applications where uh, you know there, there may be a request for missing piece of information or you know things like that you know, those sorts of administrative style things should 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 be dealt with within the process but but I think you know, largely speaking um, you've got between the EU and offshore this fundamental body of law in, in the form of EU law, which which does necessarily change the dialogue that you're having with the regulator if you're dealing with an EU regulator as opposed to 
uh, an offshore regulator. And this is particularly the case, I think, when it comes to, to fund management. Ever since 2011, when the um, Alternative Investment Fund Managers Directive came in, you know, a, a large body of law was, was effectively created by the EU as, as a form of investor protection. So we suddenly have a lot of rules on the way that managers have to market, the way that they have to structure funds, the role of a depository, and these sorts of things. And whereas in the offshore jurisdictions, you places like Cayman and BVI for many years before 2011, you know, had been running uh, quite comprehensive fund regimes in their own right, which, albeit clearly not as regulated as, as the AFMD, are nevertheless developed in their own way and over many years. It's very easy just to say, oh, you know, one regulator is quicker than the other. But I think what we have to look at is what is it they're dealing with? And so in the EU, you know, there is a larger bureaucracy. Uh, it's, it's inevitable. Um, offshore, you've got less of that. And the rules, you could say, are, have been more developed over the years and follow the market more because it's really been, I mean, offshore, it's really been, you know, we're looking at how the market runs and we're reacting to that, always on the basis that, generally speaking, the offshore sector is there for professional investment you know, for, for that part of the market rather than the retail, whereas in the EU, it, it's a bit different. I think right now is that certainly in the in the dealings that I have with, with the BVI regulator, with the, with the Financial Services Commission, that they are uh, being extremely proactive. And, and although we have all of these developments, these regulatory developments that you've been referring to, Phil, you know, with CRS, FATCA, we've got DAC 6 on the horizon, we've got AML registers and all this sort of stuff. Um, you know, they, they are still pushing through um, with extremely efficient response times uh, and those those sorts of things. So I've been very impressed with that. There's been good work also uh, in, in, in the Cayman Islands with the registration of, of private funds there. And, and obviously the, the, the local law firms there have been, have been playing their part. Closer to where I am here in Cyprus, I would say that there have been you know, various developments. We, we have the year of the regulator here in Cyprus. They, they listen to us. And so we have a good dialogue. Strictly speaking, what I would say is the difference in regulatory approach between offshore and, and in the EU is, is going to be length of time. The offshore regulators are, are, are very nimble. And that is a consequence of, of the regimes. And also, the, as I say, the regimes have built up over the years. Um, so, yeah. It, it really depends, I think, on, on exactly what it is that we need to need to do. I think we generally have the confidence in the ear of the regulators where we're based, and we have got excellent people with, within our staff as well. So, so we we always try to spot issues and, and manage expectations as well. I think I think that's that's a really important point that the, the actual upfront conversation with the client, we will always try and a help them choose the sort of best jurisdiction for them entirely, you know, agnostically from, from our perspective, uh, depending on exactly what they might want to do. That may include actually a jurisdiction that we don't work in. And we, we obviously then have a, you know, a very broad network of people we can refer people to, to make sure they're getting the very best answer for them. And then secondly, as you say, we, we manage expectations. So I would fully expect that someone wanting to to set up an incubator fund in the BVI would, would expect a different time frame and a different cost base than someone doing a UCIT in Luxembourg. And obviously giving them the full heads up as to how that process might work just comes from the experience that you and, and, and the global team have. So I think that's, I think that's incredibly important. As, as we sort of touched on in some of the other podcasts, you know, the, the regulatory red tape around the investment management industry is something that that people bemoan constantly. You know, we, we, we talk about the barrier for entry being higher and higher for the new managers. They've just got so much to think about. But playing devil's advocate as a sort of regulatory lawyer, you know, do, do, you, feel, do you feel actually the industry has benefited in some ways from the likes of FATCA and CRS and, and AML processes? Do you see some value in it? I think it was something that was always going to happen. But I think generally we're seeing a centralisation of, of, of a lot of the lawmaking powers and thinking so it may not necessarily be a legislature such as i don't know the eu or the or the us but but you've got a central body that's doing a lot of the thought processing like the oecd what that therefore means is that 
jurisdictions and small jurisdictions in particular are feeding into this process and the the upside of this is that they've basically become positive stakeholders in this global discussion and i think the upside of that is that we, we are starting to see an acknowledgement by other jurisdictions of this leveling up. And, and we see this mostly, for example, in the context of AML tax blacklistings coming off certain blacklists. So, so you know, a few years ago, all the EU member states had their own tax blacklists. Um, recent developments have meant that that's all been centralised into an EU process. There's been recognition by governments that those jurisdictions can come off certain blacklists and so therefore things like certain withholding taxes and, and this, that and the other do not apply in a way that they would have in the past. The world is ever evolving and, and I think it, it was absolutely right for places like BVI and Cayman to take the positions that they uh, that they did take historically in, in terms of accepting all of these trends. And I think there is an argument to say that investors are demanding a lot of this as well. You know, that there was a time when this was a bit sort of wild, wild west. Investors were looking to make a quick buck and, you know, accepting the risks and running away. I think if you're looking to bring in certainly, certainly not just high net worth, but family offices and then institutional grade investors, they're going to fully expect you to have all of these bells and whistles, fully expect you to be using jurisdictions in full compliance with international standards without sort of blacklisting issues, et cetera. So it's driven by demand, you know, as, as much as anything, which I absolutely appreciate means it's harder to get started. But still, when, when the fundamental desire is to raise capital, you know, you, you, you have to accept that if investors want this, you've got to do it. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, we, we often look at the headline of, oh, you know, which... Um, you know, is, is this is a particular jurisdiction in compliance or not in compliance? And there, this this need to be perceived as whitelist is is extremely important, and it's coming into into contracts, into documentation. So, and even if it's not necessarily uh, within within certain documents and express clauses, uh, there's absolutely the need within institutions to ensure that they're dealing with, with whitelist jurisdictions. Yeah, I agree. As a, as a final question, I always like to, um, to use you as a bit of a barometer for what's going on on the planet. And, you know, there is always something hot in the regulatory space. In, in almost every year I've known you, it's been the year of something. What are you seeing at the moment? And what's your, what's your take on sort of things that are, that are evolving in the evolution of this space? Yeah, it's easier to see the trends, I think, in hindsight than when you're when you're living them right now. I mean, obviously, the, the immediate thing to say for right now is this is the year of, of COVID, unfortunately. So everything uh, in 2020 is, I think, on the one side, possibly gauged towards what's going to happen in the US election. And, uh, you know, but at the same time, also, you know, what, what are the measures that the managers and, and, and credit and financial institutions more broadly taking to ensure that they can they can work and their workforces can work properly in this, in this pandemic situation. I think it would be staggering if in, in the year of 2020 it wasn't a little bit a little bit dull, um, given given all that's going on. But um, your practice is very far from dull, and thank you very much indeed for, for taking the time to talk us through it. Um, you know you, your experience stands you in in fantastic stead. So um, it's been great to speak to you, and thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having me on, Phil.